Thank you, Matt. It's actually 15 miles, not 15k. <laughs> and I'm not looking forward to it, I can tell you. Um, hello. Uh, Eve, what a wonderful presentation. Just to echo the thoughts in the room, I thought that was informative and right on the money. Your, your comments about Donald Trump being the real Voldemort, your secret is safe with us. Um, so you've had a member of the royal family and a cabinet minister at the conference this week, but you've saved the really posh surroundings for the bloke from the co-op. <laughs> it's good to see that Oxford farming is becoming the real conference of the people, something that I never imagined would happen. That said, if I am invited back next year, please somebody remind me to bring some thermals. But seriously, I want to start by mentioning Michael Goh's contribution to the conference yesterday. Clearly a lot for us to reflect on, but one thing was clear. In Michael, I think we have a Secretary of State who is passionate about this sector, who will challenge us all to be brave and to be bold in embracing change, not only caused by Brexit, but change at its most diverse and profound. I'll say more about the importance of the environment, high standards, innovation and productivity later. And there are some similar threads to what you were hearing yesterday. But first, it's become a cliché to say that change is the new constant and that every business is always in a state of continuous improvement. In fact, your ability to manage and lead your business through change has become the number one essential requirement for the job spec when recruiting any new boss. That was certainly the case at the co-op when I became its group CEO earlier this year. That's probably because we've had more than our fair share of change in these recent years. Some of it we've chosen and some of it was forced upon us by a crisis. Those recent experiences have influenced my thinking and leadership and I want to share that learning with you today. But I also want to address some bigger themes because I believe there's something more going on today than the tribulations of one particular business or business leader. We're facing something greater than the latest fashion in corporate leadership style or even the normal ups and downs of the UK economy. The scale, complexity and breadth of the change we are facing is unparalleled in my lifetime. I'm thinking of environmental challenges and its threats. I'm thinking of the ongoing revolution driven by the advances of data and the emergence of social media. A younger generation that's going to be less well off than our own parents. Local communities losing their real resilience. A breakdown in trust between ordinary people and institutions. An ageing population and their care needs. And of course, Brexit. The question is not how to embrace this change, but can we embrace it? Are we capable of the reinvention that may be required of all of us? And that reinvention may be greater in the farming industry than in any other parts of the UK economy. I want to give you my take on this and tell you how the co-op is responding to some of these challenges and what I think it means for the farming industry in the UK. But so you understand where I'm coming from, I need to give you a bit of co-op history. We love our history at the co-op. Sometimes I think we can't help ourselves from looking backwards, but we have good reason to. We have a compelling story with a rich heritage of innovation. We have a set of values which we'd like to say are part of our DNA, and we believe we are an iconic British brand. The young women and men in Rochdale who created the model for a successful consumer-owned retail business were truly pioneers. It was a commercial response to an urgent social need, the lack of safe food at fair prices. And their solution kept the profits in their local community. In today's language, it was a radical disruption to the market. It wasn't capitalism, it wasn't socialism. It was mutuality and it was timely and it was relevant. And because it was so timely and relevant, it spread like wildfire across Britain from the mid-19th century onwards. By the mid-20th century, the co-op dominated the British High Street. We looked after millions of farm members from cradle to grave. We fed them, 
We dressed them, we furnished their homes, we insured them, and then hopefully, after a full and healthy life, we buried them. But the co-op was always more than a chain of shops with a shared brand. The co-op was a movement. And when I say a movement, I mean a shared ideal, a bold agenda for social change, something far more ambitious than just running shops. We were at the heart of the community in which we traded. We were helping to create community life and lift community spirit. But then it all started to go wrong. We lost our way and we failed to spot what was changing. We definitely didn't embrace change. Instead, we let, us let it pass us by. The decades following the Second World War were a story of slow, managed decline in the co-op. And while we declined, the new grocery pioneers grew and prospered. Society was changing fast, and we didn't know how to respond. Ideas of collective and mutual solutions fell out of fashion. The co-op, as a model of ownership, no longer looked relevant, and we couldn't work out how to reinvent it. When I arrived in 2012, we had made a number of strategic mistakes in our food business, and there was the well-documented bank crisis. So what did I learn from all this about managing change? Face into the problems and act fast. Take the painful decisions quickly. Take your team with you, and most importantly, start the change at the shelf edge. The message of change must flow bottom up, not top down. Our simple strategy for the food business could be summed up as better products at better prices in better stores. That strategy needed a relentless focus on its execution, and that's what we've been doing. Getting the food business back on track gave us time to ask ourselves some fundamental questions about our future following the bank crisis. What's the co-op for? Do we still matter? Are we still relevant? And if we are, how do we prove it? How does a business that dates back to 1844 remain distinctive and relevant nearly two centuries later? And how do you make co-op membership meaningful again? It didn't take us long to realise that the answer to our future would be, we would be found by rediscovering our past. We had to go back to being co-op. And to signal the changes we were making, we chose to return to a familiar look from our past. Back to being co-op was a nice phrase, but what did it really mean? We needed to find new ways to return value to our members, because at the end of the day, that's what all co-ops are meant to do. And we needed to reconnect with the communities that we serve, because strengthening communities has always shown the co-op at its best. So when you become a member today, we now reward you every time you choose co-op brand. And not only do we give back to you, we give back to your community as well. The more you spend, the more you and your community benefit from being part of the co-op. Since we relaunched membership in September 2016, we've given £20 million to around 8,000 local causes selected by our members. That works out at around £2,000 for each project. And that kind of money makes a real difference. For some, it's been the difference between continuing the work and stopping it. Here's a couple of examples of how that money is making a real difference in local communities and making them stronger and more resilient. Can we run the VT, please? It's good to know that you can help the community without actually having to do anything, just get in your shopping. I choose Sage because it was a very worthwhile cause. It helps victims of domestic abuse. The turnaround in these women and the confidence that they gain within themselves is brilliant. When you think that it's the end of the world and you're just not going to survive or be at any worth to anybody, and then you meet a group of people that are in the same boat. It's nice how you can find somebody in all that darkness. 
just to become a friend. The other thing is the dark humour, because it, it just kind of gets it all out and you can laugh at it. <laughs> it makes me proud to be supporting this cause. It's a great thing to do. I'm a very inefficient shopper. That means I have to go to the co-op every day. And that's when I found out about the Good Causes campaign that they do as part of the membership. I chose York Road really because I had a prior interest in homelessness. It's very difficult when you go through an experience like this. It kind of breaks you as a person. It makes you feel like you're not worth uh, anything anymore. It really hurts your self-esteem. Being homeless and on the streets thinking, oh, I've got nothing that can, you know, help me become a normal person. At first, um, it was really challenging, but as soon as I found your pride, things didn't make it a lot easier. It's just the way the staff care. That's what's really built my confidence. You can have loads of activities to keep you busy. Everything is here. I feel I've achieved something for the community. I think we use sign language. <laughs> OK. We put £70 million back into members' wallets, and that's really important in the age of austerity. We continue to create value in many other ways too, like our 11 co-op academies, each one focused on turning a failing school into a great school and giving children in some of the most deprived parts of the country a better chance in life. We'll continue to build our academies this year and open a further four. After a national vote by our members, we chose to make tackling loneliness in local communities a major theme of our work in partnership with the British Red Cross. We're also returning to our campaigning routes, leading the way to help the victims of modern slavery. We've addressed that lack of trust between people and big institutions by giving our members a say in how the business they own is run today. We have 100 people elected to our National Members' Council and four seats on our board are taken up by member elected directors. That's how you start to restore trust in big business. We're developing a co-op response to the digital revolution with a new centre of excellence in Manchester that's creating a community of like-minded digital pioneers from inside and outside the business. These are people who are committed to a digital future that will change all our lives for the better and not just create a handful of digital billionaires with far too much power and influence. To create these new expressions of value, we have to be running a commercially successful family of businesses too. So we've been investing heavily in all of our businesses over the last couple of years. For food, that's meant improving the quality and distinctiveness of our brand by caring about our supply chain the ethics that sit behind our buying decisions and the provenance of the ingredients that we use. That decision to focus on quality and ethics has given us a point of difference that went a long way to securing our wholesaling deals with NYSA and Costcutter at the end of last year. All of this is what's making membership meaningful again. And since, since September 2016, a million more people have joined our co-op. So what does that mean for British farming? And what does creating value for our members look like when it comes to farming in Britain today? I hope that most of you are aware of the commitment that we made last year to buy 100% British meat for all co-op own branded products. It's something many of our members and customers have wanted us to do for a long time. Just as we believe it's right to champion fair trade with our suppliers on the other side of the world, we should also support our farmers in Britain today. But to deliver this commitment to British farmers and to our customers and members has meant understanding every link in our supply chain across every part of the country. We had to know it was possible for you to supply us with all we needed so we could offer fresh cuts of beef and lamb as well as chicken and pork, plus bacon, plus ready meals, scotch eggs and all of our sandwich ingredients so we would all be British all of the time. Lamb, as you'd expect, has been the biggest challenge and we've widened our lamb farming group to aid this and worked closely with each of those farmers so we can guarantee the availability that we need. We're now working with 32 farming businesses in Northern Ireland, 
Scotland, Wales and England and can source our supply by staggering the lambing season across the country. The farming groups we've established for each category also enable us to work in partnership with them to agree standards of welfare for livestock and care for the environment. The president of the NFU, Mireg Raymond, came to our AGM last year to say thank you for the commitment to British farming. But I want to say thank you to you from the co-op because we would have, we've done this together. We've made this happen for the British public. We've backed this with a big marketing campaign on TV, in print and online, and of course in our stores. So what comes next? Well, Frozen comes next as we make the same 100% switch for all of our co-op branded fresh meat from this spring. Take your humble pork pie, your beef burger, even your bacon sarnie. What if they weren't just delicious? What if they only came from British farms? 100%. So the food you put on your plate puts food on the plates of British farmers and their communities. Wouldn't that make it taste even better? So from now on at Co-op, 100% of our fresh meat will come from British farms. No ifs, no buts. Just 100% British to the last pork pie. I know that this commitment to 100% British meat is not possible for the biggest retailers in the UK, but it was possible for us, and so we've made it happen. I focused on meat, but we're also extending British seasons for homegrown fruit and vegetables, extending the British flower varieties that we sell, and setting up fish farming groups too. In dairy, we put in place British sourcing credentials across our core dairy products, and we ensure a fair farm gate price for our co-op dairy group supplying our liquid milk. Together with our commitment to meet, this is a billion pound investment in British farming from the co-op. I talked earlier about creating strong, resilient communities and as an example of creating co-op value. But what does that actually mean when it comes to rural parts of the country? Local sourcing is one way that we're doing that, encouraging small scale entrepreneurs in the food and drink industry to take the next step and reach more customers. At the co-op, we believe it's in our interest and the interest of our members to support the next generation of British farmers too. To Britain's young farmers, we say, we need you to be here. But we know it's not easy. Farming can be tough, but it can also offer a great career with responsibility, challenges, opportunities and rewards that you see in no other industry particularly at such an early age. We want to maximise those career opportunities for you. So in 2016, we launched our Farming Pioneer programme to create a network of young farmers who can share their skills and understanding with each other and us and learn to compete and adapt to the ever-changing markets. But now I have an ask of you in this room and the farming community across the UK. I need you to champion the co-op in the way that the co-op is championing you. I want you to tell people who, what we're doing at the co-op and encourage everyone to support British farmers and British farming. For us to keep this commitment to British farming, we need more people to come and shop at the co-op, and that includes farmers themselves. Please don't go to our rivals on the high street to buy New Zealand lamb in the winter when co-op up the road are selling British. All of which brings me to Brexit and some observations I'd like to make about the nature of our trading relationship with Europe, the best way to exit the EU and the opportunities that it could bring. It's safe to say that our four and a half million owners will have been as divided on the question of Europe as the rest of the country was on the 23rd of June 2016. They had concerns about national sovereignty, worries about immigration and disillusionment with distant and out-of-touch authorities. For farmers, I know the margin for leave at the time was higher overall than in the national population. That shows how significant our farming relationship with Europe has become over the last 40 years. In other words, you've been at the sharp end of all that's been both good and bad about the EU. What I have to say today comes from a co-op perspective based on our history, our values, and our most recent experience of adapting to and embracing change. 
Right now, we're dealing with increasing food inflation, driven by a weaker pound, and the money markets wait for Brexit clarity. There's only so much we can do to avoid passing this on to customers. Hopefully, a well-negotiated departure from the EU could deal with this. In my view, for Brexit to be good for our members, good for farmers and good for Britain, it needs to be a cooperative Brexit, in the broadest sense of the word. It needs to be an exit that avoids a cliff-edge departure. It needs to be a Brexit that allows us to build higher standards in the food industry and remain an influential player on the world stage. Let me explain why I think this. Climate change is one of those big issues which I mentioned at the start, and it's already changing the way we live and work and do business. I certainly welcome Michael Goh's commitment to caring for the environment, made at the conference yesterday. It's good news that future farm subsidy payments will be used to encourage farmers to protect our planet. The Co-op has a long history of campaigning on environmental history, uh, issues. Nearly 100% of our store and branch estate is powered by renewable sources of energy. And in the past, we've championed solar power in UK schools, and our aim is to make 100% of our food packaging easy to recycle with an interim target of 80% by 2020. We recently backed the Greenpeace call for plastic bottle deposit schemes to reduce plastic pollution. What we've learnt is that there's only so much you can do by yourselves without also working with local authorities, national government and competitors. As a nation, you can't tackle climate change alone. The air and the sea don't recognise lines on a map. This is one of the biggest issues of our generation, so our future relationship with Europe has to recognise that a coordinated, cooperative approach to climate change is needed if we're to create a level playing field for all businesses across the globe. Another reason why we mustn't close doors on Europe is our access to labour markets. Today, we currently employ thousands of colleagues from the continent. They work in our stores, in our logistics depots and our funeral homes. They're part of our working family. We want them to be here, and we need them to be here. I know that many agricultural businesses feel the same way about EU nationals working for them today. And for those businesses, this issue is absolutely critical to their future. Thankfully, at stage one of the negotiations come to some kind of resolution at the end of last year, it looks like this concern has been addressed. But as the politicians are fond of telling us, nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. So we don't have cast iron guarantees that will give individuals, their families and their businesses that they work for the security that they need. The bottom line is, we don't have the right labour in the right places that we need in the UK today. And we are an ageing population. We will continue to need both skilled and unskilled labour to come to this country to work in many sectors. So let's not make that harder to achieve through an uncooperative Brexit. As the biggest co-op in Britain, we have a role in championing cooperative enterprise across all sectors of the UK economy. And I agree with Co-ops UK, the body that promotes cooperation in Britain, which said before Christmas that the public policy case for cooperation in agriculture is stronger than ever. Inside the EU, the Commission is making noises about strengthening the role of agricultural cooperatives to redress the imbalances in power in the supply chains. Whilst meanwhile in Britain, reports from the Agriculture and Horticulture Development Board on how farmers can co cope outside the EU suggests an urgent need to step up collaboration and cooperation in order to improve our own efficiency and commercial resilience. We lag behind other EU countries in terms of cooperative market share, with a significant knock-on effect around volatility and financial return for our primary producers, especially small and medium-sized farms. I'd like to see practical steps included in the government strategy to encourage more co-op farming. That should include a campaign to promote the benefits of collaboration and cooperation to farmers and growers and to food and farming supply chains. We live in a world where every major economic and social issue we face has a global dimension. 
Is there any way to think rationally about the challenges we face as a nation that's not international in its outlook today? Climate change, the movement of labour, the need for long-term resilience in a fast-moving world. You can't embrace change like this by becoming Little Britain. The fact is, we will need to become global cooperators in the broadest sense if we are to tackle the biggest threats and make the most of the greatest opportunities that are out there today. When it comes to Europe, there are some facts of life that we can't ignore. Europe is our biggest and most long-standing trading partner. Geography and culture means that that will always be the case. In 2016, the Food and Drink Federation said that more than 70% of the value of UK's food and drink exports went to the EU. In or out of the EU, European countries will continue to be our most important customers. So let's not damage that by forgetting the most basic realities of UK trade. We need to have a mindset where we're open to the opportunities of leaving the EU as well as the risks. The exact nature of our departure will determine how the scales tip at the end of the day. My belief is that British farming should be known for quality and welfare. We should not make leaving the EU the starting gun for a race to the bottom. We already have world leading standards of animal husbandry, traceability and care for the environment. Let's build on that reputation rather than lose it. All of this points to the need for a cooperative Brexit. Of course, we shouldn't forget these issues facing British farming today long predate Brexit. And those issues will remain however hard or soft or cooperative our final exit turns out to be. Wherever we end up by March 2019, harmonised, aligned, converged or tipped into WTO, farmers will still need to embrace change. My advice from leading the co-op group is keep close to your customers. Assume that tastes and behaviours will keep changing. Never lose sight of commercial realities. Stay ambitious and innovative and look to add value to your products that others can't match and can't copy. Finally, let me leave you with a story about one of our co-op lamb suppliers who has proved it is possible to do all of these things. Just before Christmas, I had the pleasure to meet Tim May from Hampshire. Tim is the managing director of King's Clare, a two and a half thousand acre estate where his family has farmed for four generations. Until 2013, the farm was all arable, as it had been for many years. But Tim, after studying through a Nuffield scholarship and travelling the world, understood it was time to take some risks if his long-term future was to be assured. Tim has transformed the farm from a solely arable enterprise to a mixed operation with sheep, cattle, chicken and pigs. Yes, livestock. He's passionate about soil management and uses livestock as a grazing tool to recuperate the soil, which enables him to grow root vegetables too. In 2013, he took the decision to buy his first flock of 1,000 ewes. Tim's ewes, now lamb, in May, six to eight weeks later than the traditional spring period. But it works for him and it works for us. His decision to diversify into livestock is helped by knowing he has a buyer for his lamb in the co-op. Lambs help him keep the nutrients in the soil without buying fertiliser, and by lambing later, he doesn't have to keep his animals inside, thus saving costs. It's an example of innovation and diversification that will give Tim's family the long-term sustainability and the means to weather whatever comes next because of Brexit. Tim told me something I'm sure many of you would agree with. There's no better fertiliser than a farmer's shadow. In other words, a farmer needs to stay close to the ground, quite literally, if their business is to grow and flourish. The same grows for retailing, by the way. Like the co-op at its best, British farming has always been bold and innovative and kept pace with a changing society and changing markets. Tim May is an example of a farmer who's not standing still, waiting to be done to. He's taken the decision to shape his own future rather than stand on the sidelines. It's the innovators who will ultimately succeed. And if any of you have good ideas, don't be shy in sharing them. Civil servants need to look beyond the policy and understand the practice. Get them onto your farms and together, let's walk them through the supply chain from farm to fork. 
Tim and many other farmers across the UK who are already embracing change are evidence that we can give value and maintain values in a cooperative way, whatever Brexit brings in 2018 and beyond. Thank you.